Today, I'm speaking with Nicolas Kuzmich. Uh, Nick is an expert, not only in Facebook ads, but online marketing. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, business, how you can position yourself, and we're going to end the conversation with what you can learn from life uh, when you have to face unexpected things like uh, he had to do with his family with the fire in Kelowna. Enjoy the conversation with Nicolas Kuzmich. Hello, and welcome to a new episode of the Business of Meaning podcast. And I've been waiting many, many, many more months to have uh, our guest today back on the show. He's absolutely phenomenal. The way he describes himself is helping uh, information entrepreneurs scale their revenue uh, with easily getting more clients with marketing that doesn't suck, which is mm -hmm. uh, kind of fun. But he is the true expert of Facebook advertising, of online uh, marketing. And I know and I've seen over the years, you know, people are expert in COVID and then suddenly they're expert in uh, the next financial crisis. And then they're expert in uh, Facebook ad and then the expert of whatever the right. taste of the month. This guy has been the, not one of, but the expert on Facebook advertising and online marketing. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome back Nikola Kuzmich. Nick, hello. How are you? Eric, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I appreciate it. And it does. It feels like it's been so long since our last conversation. So I'm, I'm really excited to, to just be visiting with you again and, and having a chat here. Thank you. And, and I'm glad you, you're back because there have been so many, many, many changes. Uh, so many different platforms are coming up. Sure. The uh, AI and, and all those different topics that, that we're going to talk about. But before we, we get into that, your dream was not to be a Facebook ad specialist uh, <laughs> when you grow up. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, actually, you know, it's a great question. I, I mean, it's still not my dream to be a Facebook ad specialist. I, I love helping people. And I found, at least for now, one of the ways, and we could talk about other ways as well, but one of the main ways that, that we found to be able to do that is helping businesses that have something that's worth marketing and mm -hmm. helping their getting, getting their message to the world. But again, I never woke up one day as a, as a young youth saying, oh, Facebook ads is the way. In fact, I don't even think Facebook ads was around back then. Um, but I, I somehow, and I think everybody could relate to this, but I think in the depth of each of our beings, there's some sort of a calling and you can use the word whatever you want, but there was just some sort of a drive, a desire to help people. I didn't know what that meant at the time. I didn't know what it looked like. I didn't know how it would manifest in my life. But there was this innate desire to say, like, I'm put on this planet to do something of positive value. I just didn't know what that was. And then I had what some might call a religious experience, you know, when I was in junior high school. And that shaped my worldview a little bit. And that then led me down a path of going into ministry, of all things. And so very quickly, I kind of accelerated through that, that process. And by the time I was 19, I was fully ordained as a, a minister, a pastor. I had started a church and I did that for gosh 14 years nonstop but all the while and I guess this might provide some context as to how I do what I do now and where I think I'm going to be going in the future you know all the while a couple of things I didn't like you know about traditional religious institution and one thing I said was I just didn't want to take a salary from the church I didn't want it to be my primary source of income because I didn't want people to look at me and say hey like I'm paying for your lifestyle and your car and your clothes and your shirt and not that I dressed fancy or anything like that but I just I didn't feel good about that so all the while while I was doing this pastoring thing I had a side hustle on internet marketing and internet marketing was essentially what was paying the bills and helping me do all this stuff on the side and so as I was pastoring for 14 years, I was doing this stuff on the side. And then when it came time for us to step away from that work, I just more full-time stepped into this work. And that's what we've been doing now since, gosh, 2008 mm -hmm. uh, on Facebook. And then maybe 2011 full-time, you know, in the internet marketing slash online advertising space. And there's also uh, the book that you wrote, Give, which is behind me as well. Yeah, um, I love that. Thank you. I reread it actually, um, knowing that we we're going to talk. And and the aspect that I love that is the human side that you expose and, and how you were able to finally help your mom and, and offer her uh, you know, material stuff that you were not you didn't have an easy life. Right. Uh, and, right. and you were you, you were able to do that. And that I think it's ex it's extreme extremely sorry, inspiring uh, in your journey as well. Well, I think, and I thank you for bringing that up. I think we all have different motivations as to why we do what we do. 
you know, and I wish I could say I was born an entrepreneur, like born out of my parents and just thinking I had the, the, the DNA of an entrepreneur. I don't see that way for me. I see it as I was forced into entrepreneurship. Because again, my I, I witnessed my father have his first heart attack when I was four years old, and he's been in, in and out of hospital until he passed away. So I was surrounded by that. And then simultaneously, my mother, who's an immigrant uh, to Canada, she couldn't speak English well. She was looking for a job. She couldn't get a job. And so she came home crying one day. And I just remember sitting there as a teenager saying, I'm not going to allow this to happen to her. I'm not going to allow this to happen to myself. I'm not going to allow this to happen to my future family. I was motivated to say, I am going to figure out a way that my family and those around me will not have to suffer like I did. If there's a way I could figure that out. So that kind of like thrust me into the entrepreneurship game. And it's, you know, anyone who says it's easy, I love the people who pitch it as, oh, it's so easy. Yeah, I just start a business and you'll make millions and life will be amazing. And yeah, it's not easy. And yes, you can make millions and tens of millions. And yes, you know, fine. You know, and that's been the case for me, but not easily. And it's work and it's effort. So I think you need to have a special DNA and you need, you know, there's a lot of people who say, but they, the, the ancient old saying is, if you have a why, you'll figure out the how. Mm. And so I had a, a why and that motivated me to figure out the how, and I'm still figuring out the how every day because that, that why just stays with me every single day, every moment I'm awake. I've got two young, beautiful children, a beautiful wife. And uh, that's the reason why we just keep going despite the difficulties and the hardships and the pains and all that stuff that could potentially come up. I was going to say amen to that, but that would bring you back. I'll, I'll take it. Cycle. I feel it. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I ju just on last note, when you know you talk about your mom and crying, couldn't find, uh, didn't speak English. And when we moved here ten years ago, I was reminded recently that my my second one one day was in school, uh, and next to her was a girl crying, and the teacher said, "Why are you crying?" Said. I don't want to be sitting next to Shirelle because she's stupid. She doesn't speak English. Oh, wow. And it was hard, very hard on her. Uh, and of course, at the end of the year, she was the best in the class because yeah, for sure. <laughs> it, it's how she is and how yeah. my, my three daughters are. But uh, it's very hard. Uh, and to your point about entrepreneurship, there's nothing easy. But that's also, uh, you know, uh, as they say, uh, the entrepreneur is somebody who wants to work 80 hours a week uh, to avoid working 40 hours for somebody else. Right. Uh, and we can go on and on and yeah, you don't need to work at the hours, but well, anyway, if you enjoy that, sure. it's great. So you yeah. are back to uh, after your, your, you know, you start your business, you're helping uh, people online. There's been such a change in the industry. It's, it's almost yeah. like every year there's a new platform. Every year there's a, every six months, there's a, there's a new algorithm. Um, <laughs> How do you cope with that? And, and how could anyone cope with that? Yeah, I, I love the question. Because when people, I think it's just people having their eyes fixed on the wrong thing. So when, pe when you fix your eyes on the algorithm, when you fix your eyes on the platform, when you fix your eyes on, oh, look, AI is coming, and you fix your eyes on all the new things, it's very easy to get overwhelmed and feel like, how am I supposed to keep up? How am I supposed to understand? How am I supposed to progress? How am I supposed to use all this that's available to me and not feel buried and watch my business go into the ground. Because also on top of all these algorithmic changes and platforms and AI and bots and this and that and whatever, there's also behind every new thing is a whole group of really smart marketers who start marketing to you and saying, if you don't have this, you're going to die, essentially. You don't you mm -hmm, need this mm -hmm. or your business is going to fail or you're not going to be, yeah. what are you going to fall behind? And so I think everybody needs to understand and keep everything in stride. And what that means for me is what I understand at the very core of everything is that human psychology doesn't change. Mm. We all have behavioral patterns. We are all triggered and not in the, the bad sense, but we all have transactional triggers, as I like to call them, things that cause us to buy, things that allow us to see value in things versus val non-value in other things. And so if you could see the fundamental premise, and again, I'm not just talking about marketing, although that's my main thing, but human behavior with, and psychology with your children and your friends and all of it, like we are just humans on this planet having interactions with each other. And some of that is transactional with money. And some of that is transactional with like emotions. And some of that is with complete strangers. It's how we say hi when we get our coffee from Starbucks or whatever. And so the very fundamental 
basis. We are humans living on a planet who have interactions with each, with, with each other. So as a marketer, then I just see, okay, well, AI comes out or this comes out or a new tool or an algorithmic change and everybody freaks out. Like, what do I do now? We have to remember the difference between strategy and tactics. We got to remember the difference between fundamental human living. And so my whole thing is predicated on the realization that I study human behavior more than anything. That is what the, the, I understand human behavior. Mm -hmm. And so if a tool comes out, cool, that's all it is. It's a tool in my toolbox. Can I use it? Maybe. If I can't, I ignore it. If I can, great. If there's an mm -hmm. algorithmic change on, on a platform, do I freak out like, oh my God, uh, my tracking is not working? No, because at the end of the day, it's human psychology, human behavior. How do we have conversations with people? And how do we move people from a point of I'm not happy where I am to this is what I need to be happy. And however we do that with whatever tool set we use, with whatever platform we use, whatever algorithm is available to us, mm -hmm. that's how we're going to do it. And in a marketing sense, I, I make the joke sometimes like, if we were to go back 100 years or 50 years for that matter and talk to the old school, like original marketers of our time, and we tell them, man, can't market anymore because the, the meta pixel is, is acting funny on me. Like they would just look at us and laugh. Like, are you serious? Mm. We didn't have any meta pixels back in the day. Like we understood we have the written word or the spoken word or the auditory word. And that's how we conduct life and business. And so, yeah, despite all of that, I don't care what can come. I don't care if meta goes away tomorrow. I, it, none of it matters. Because at the end of the day, again, I'm a, I'm a student of human behavior and human psychology uh, mm -hmm. for all purposes of my life. And as a result of that, you could utilize that for business and relationships and emotional benefits and children and all of it. Love it. Absolutely love it. I'm, not, I'm a big proponent of uh, focusing on what you do best and uh, surrounding yourself with people that can do the, the rest, which is also necessary in the business. Yes. When it comes to... This type of work, uh, of having a presence on social media, on selecting mm. the platform, what is your advice, the question you think that any business owner should be asking to a, a potential partner, potential vendor in the field, knowing that, you know, you talk about AI, it seems that every day now I, I see a new expert on AI, uh, which was probably an expert in, in COVID two years ago. And how do I select the right partner for my needs and for, for building my brand and, and my business? Yeah. So I think there's a couple of ways to look at that. One of the ways is to just not just get extracted by the magic bullet fluffy stuff that everyone looks at. Oh, new tool, new this, new that, new whatever. I think you gotta, everyone's got to take a few steps back and say, okay, what, what, what am I actually looking to accomplish and why? And then ask that why five times. Right. So like, OK, what am I looking to accomplish? I want more exposure. OK, why do you want more exposure? Well, because I think more exposure will get me more clients. Well, why do you want more clients or why do you think more? Exposure? OK, well, because if think if more people see me and then they might go through my process and then I might be. But but why? Right. So like first go all the way back to what you're looking to do. Ask why five times and then actually realize the starting point of what you're looking to do, because I guarantee you eight times out of 10, you're going to think, huh. Well, maybe I don't need more exposure anymore, actually. Maybe that's not the key. Maybe I just got distracted because some marketer told me that that's actually what I need. Right. So I think that's the like the starting point. But let's say you get past all of that and you got to a point where you say, okay, I know what I need and I know how to get there. Honestly, here's what I do. Because like we work with vendors and contractors and people and support teams and all that. I'm a big proponent of what Dean Jackson calls asking the right question, right? Uh -huh. So you're asking who, not how. I think that's the best question that any entrepreneur can ask, because if you ask how, there's a million and one steps to get yep. to the final result. If you ask who, the who person does all the steps and you just go about your day and doing your thing. So I'm a big proponent of asking the question, who can help me accomplish this versus how can I accomplish this myself? But once you get to that point, I think the greatest test is, look, there's a ton of great marketers out there who are saying a lot of great things, who can say, hey, I can help you get this, that, and the other. So first question I always ask is, again, once I know my why, is have you done this for other people multiple times in multiple industries with multiple successes? If the answer is yes, we can have a conversation. If you can't even say that, this, I am maybe because I'm a marketer, I am blind to good marketing. I don't care what you say, mm -hmm. right? I want to go back to that. And then the second thing I found, and this is super practical, and I know I don't know if it's the answer that you were looking for, 
But it's amazing when I've had con- when when I've had conversations with vendors, I ask one simple question after I get through all that that stuff. I ask one simple question. I say, "Can you refer me to three people who are currently working with you now? Yep, we're getting a result, and three people who stopped working with you." Interesting. And if they say, "No, I can't do that," right? Well, then no problem because the immediate feedback I get all the time is, oh, well, you know, my clients are busy just like you. They don't have time to do that. I'm like, I don't need to talk to them on the phone. I'm just going to send them an email or maybe a voice note on text. I'm not expecting anything long in return. I'm asking for 20 seconds of their time. And if you've got clients that really love and support you, they're going to be able to turn around and give me 20 seconds to sing your praises. Now, when I reach out to the people who they referred, current clients, I always say something along the lines of this. Hey, I know if you're currently working with Eric, it must mean you're a happy client. Because if you're not, there's no reason for you to continue working with him. So I'm not interested in all the good stuff that they do. But I want to know, A, were there any growing pains in learning with them? And two, have there any been any frustrations? Because let's face it, no client's perfect. And I get Eric might not be perfect. And I I love him. I think he's great. I just want to know these things so I can manage my expectations better going into the relationship. And the responses that I get are phenomenal. They're like, Eric's great. He does this. He does that. He's really helped us with this. But here's two things that we came to learn working with Eric. I'm, uh, I'm using you as an example. Please understand. I don't want anyone who's listening or watching this to think that this is, uh, you know, don't this worry. is real. Don't worry. And, yeah. and by the way, but, you cannot please everyone. So I'm totally fine. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But like, so in a recent co- correspondence I had, you know, the person got back to me and said, you know, so-and-so is great. They do real good work, et cetera, et cetera. But there's two things I noticed. One, their communication time is very slow. Good to know, right? They don't respond quickly to two things. Okay, that's good to know. Um, secondly, um, something about they have a high turnover on their team. So we found a new account manager working with us every a couple months, and that wasn't good. Okay, good to know, right? Mm-hmm. So I want to know what's not working well before I ever engage with the client. Doesn't mean I'm not going to engage with them, but I want my expectations managed well. And then I'm going to talk to the three people who don't work with them anymore and ask them why, what happened. Was it just you moved on into a different business or was it because things just didn't work out? And I would love to know the details. Again, I'm not saying I won't work with them just because you had a bad experience with them, but I want to paint a really good picture. Mm. And nobody can hide. Like if most people just ask for the positive references, hey, so, okay, well, who are current clients that you're working with? Of course, they're going to say good things. But if I talk to three past clients that don't work with you anymore, I'm going to get a far different picture. And I think between understanding why you want to do what you want to do, Mm -hmm. and does that person have a current roster of people that they're working with that are just like you, that are getting the results that you desire, that you're happy with. And after you talk to three current clients and three past clients, that should give you enough understanding and indication as to whether or not you should take that next step. I absolutely love what you just said. And by the way, this is something you can apply to any industry, any any business not only for what we're talking about here today so that that that's awesome i'm talking about the uh internet of things and uh, all the social media platforms that are coming up it's not as easy as it was at the beginning to have a presence or there's the seo and all this competition and the budget and so what is your advice um, let's take an example of somebody who has a corporate events agency. They have about 10 employees. They have uh, different corporate clients. Uh, and they were never thinking much about their presence online. So, and, and just to, to finish on, on the brief, let's say that their clients are a commercial director, um, CEO, or marketing director in uh, Fortune 500 companies. Sure. What is your advice uh, in terms of uh, positioning, in terms of uh, w- what they should be thinking about, um, knowing that you know nobody was waiting for anyone, uh, yeah. and it's about time that uh, they get the, their their share of the mine, as uh, Al Ries and Jack Trot wrote about sure. uh, decades ago, the battle yeah. for your mind. Yeah. Great question. So I want to reel it back one step, and then I'll answer the question. The real one step that I want to reel back is again. Do you actually need an online presence? Because the marketers will tell you, you do. And I'm going to argue that not everybody does. Like if you're in an industry where you've built out a great referral network, you've got great word of mouth and like you're not actively, aggressively doing online advertising because you don't need to for whatever reason. Maybe you have channel partners. Maybe you have a, a network of way in which you grow business. 
you know, I was speaking with uh, a gentleman who owns a mergers and acquisitions company. They're essentially a private bank and they help the sale of, of companies. I was talking with him a couple of weeks ago. He's super ultra successful. They make a billion dollars a year. And 100% of it is through what they call like advisors, which are essentially channel partners. They have people all over the world who represent them in various different industries. And essentially, you know, when any one of their clients from any one of their say, I want to sell a business, they're like, oh, I know the guy. Let me introduce you to so and so. And they've built this mega successful business in doing so. And he was looking at some of my social and some of my friends' social, and he goes, Oh, like, do I need an Instagram account? Like, should I be posting videos every day and stuff? I'm like, why? Mm. Well, because I see you do, and everyone's on it. But why? Are you doing all right now? Do you want to add more burden to your life? Like, why? Right? So let's pretend we got past those those why questions right, again. Right, right. And they say, okay, yes, yes, I do. I For X number of reasons. Here's what I think people have to realize. That's probably the foundation of all things. Before advertising, before messaging, before email marketing, before meta marketing, before any of this, we have to understand that the most important thing we can do is position ourselves as what the category pirates call a category king or queen. It's a position in the marketplace. Because if you look in any marketplace that exists currently right now, here's the reality. One or two people or businesses or brands consume or take up 74% of the market share, which means 99% of the rest of the market is fighting for scraps, essentially 26% of the marketplace. Hmm. So you have a choice of if I'm not the top person in my industry, I can fight with everybody else for the bottom 26%, or I can create what we call category one marketing, category one positioning, where I am the new leader in our space. Okay. And just to give you like examples that everyone would know, if I were to say something like on demand streaming, who is the category king of on-demand streaming? The first thing that should come to most people's mind is Netflix. Yes. Right? Behind that, yes, there's a couple of people. There's Disney Plus, there's Hulu, there's Crave, there's all these other ones. They're fighting for second place. Yeah, Netflix is losing a little of market share, but they created the category, they started the category, and now everybody competes against the category king, right? Mm -hmm. If I were to say ride sharing, first thing that people should be thinking about is Uber. Now, are there other rideshare apps out there? Yeah, there's Lyft, there's this, that, the other. But who owns the market? The category king, right? So what we have to understand here is that if we're positioning our business, the absolute worst situation we can be in is if we compare ourselves to any other business in our industry or worse, if our prospects compare us to anybody else. So if they say, oh, like if they look at me and they say, oh, well, you do Facebook ads. Uh, I know so-and-so does fa ads, uh, ads and they do ads and they do ads and they do ads and everyone does ads. Why are you any better? And the problem then is you're either fighting on a value offer. Well, we offer more things, a price difference, or we're cheaper or we're more expensive. And it's like the worst, it goes back to remember, I don't know if you remember like Pepsi, the Pepsi taste test challenge back in the 90s or 80s or however long ago, Pepsi came to the scene and basically said, we're better than Coke. And they'd go out into the public and they'd have a Pepsi can and a Coke can and they'd cover them up and pour two and say, drink it, which do you like better? And they thought it was so genius. They're going to be the smart, they're going to beat Coke, who's the category king. What were they doing every time they had a Pepsi taste test challenge? They were advertising Coke for free. They were telling everybody, look, I got a Coke. Coke is the leader. Coke is the leader. I think we're better, but Coke is the leader. And that's what often we do. We say, oh, we're like this guy, but better. We're like that or cheaper. We're like, so going back to any business, the point here is, is you have two choices on how you position yourself in the marketplace. A comparison choice, I'm mm -hmm. better, faster, cheaper, offer more value, whatever. Being around longer, we've been around since 1914. Nobody gives a rip, right? Or to say, no, all these people do that, but I do this. When you define this as being different, remember my good friend Sally Hogshead says it best. She says, different is better than better. You don't want to be better. You want to be different. Yeah. And so when you understand the psychology of your ideal prospect, and when you understand their problems and what they need, and you understand 
all of that. And then you come to the scene and say, oh, this is how we tackle that. Right. And it takes a little work. And I can walk through this a little bit. I mean, when Uber first came on the scene, ride sharing or the ability to share rides was not a problem. Everyone's like, oh, just take a cab. That's easy. Mm. So the first thing Uber had to do was educate the marketplace on a problem. Let's use Netflix as a better example. Right. Everybody, Eric, do you remember a time? I don't know if you do. I almost don't remember a time where when we wanted to watch our television show, we had to wait until Thursday night at yeah. 7 p.m. and turn on the TV and watch it then. Do you remember that? Not I, only do I remember that, I remember even before that when I was the remote control for the TV for my parents. <laughs> right, at home. Yeah, right, right. Isn't that crazy? But think about this. So everyone was watching their favorite TV show on Thursday night at 7 p.m. No big deal. Until... Netflix came around and rather than saying, hey, look, we're Netflix, come buy our stuff. They said, how absurd is it that mm -hmm. you have to have appointment viewing? Wouldn't life be better if you could watch whatever you want, whenever you want? And the population was like, huh, I never thought that that was a problem. So what all of a sudden Netflix did, and this is what all category kings and queens do, is they present a problem in a new light so that the, the, the marketplace looks at that and says, oh, I didn't think about that, but that makes a lot of sense. Because the moment someone can invest into saying that is a problem, the person who introduced the problem automatically becomes category king or queen. So they don't even have to market Netflix, which is the beautiful thing about it. They market the problem. Hey, why would you want to wait until Thursday night to watch a TV show? Why don't you watch all the TV shows anytime you want on demand? And they yeah. introduced this term on demand streaming and the world was taken by storm and Netflix didn't even have to, again, advertise Netflix. They just had to advertise the problem. People caught on to the problem and all of a sudden a new category was created and there became the category king or queen. So likewise, like if you look at my business, my business, technically, we run Facebook ads and we do funnels for people, customer acquisition systems. But my stake in the flag right now, like my flag in the sand is funnels suck. Because everyone in my industry is saying, if you want to get a new customer online, you need a funnel. You need a funnel, funnel this, funnel that, funnel this, gym, you know, a, a challenge funnel, a free book funnel, a lead magnet funnel, an opt-in funnel, a webinar funnel, a VSL funnel, all sorts of funnels. And what I'm presenting to the marketplace is, have you actually ever thought about a funnel? Have you ever actually thought about this thing, right? Let's think about it. This to me is the dumbest thing ever created in the idea of internet marketing. Why? Well, number one, the idea is you take all this stuff in the top, right? All these leads and prospects. And as they go through the funnel, only your best ones come out the bottom and they buy your thing. I don't know, Eric, the last time you used one of these, I don't, I don't ever, I haven't really ever used one, but I just, just for experiment, I took this and I put it, I took a, a jug of water and I poured the water into the funnel. Guess what came out the bottom? Water. Every single thing I put in the top. It didn't strain out anything. It didn't qualify anything. That's not what happened. It all came, went in the top. And you know what the worst part about it is? Funnels actually slow down the process. If I took water and I just turned it upside down right here, bam, it would all come out instantly. If I take that same water and I put it in the funnel, it's going to trickle out and take its time to come out. Is that really what we want when we're marketing? Slow people down, the people who want to buy and the people who want to transit. Is that really what we want to do? And I also realized that funnels, for the most part, because they always start with an opt-in, and depending on what industry you're in, you're probably seeing something like this. Well, let me show you how to blank. Let me show you how to get more commercial clients. Let me show you how to run your events better. Let me show you how to whatever. And then you land on a page and you got to fill out your name and your email address. And when you do, it takes you through this process to try to show you something and teach you something. They're not really trying to teach you anything. They're disguising their sales as training. And I don't know if, about you, Eric, but I know me, every time I see an opt-in page, I don't opt in. Mm -hmm. And if I do, I use my fake information, right? And I'm a really good prospect. So to me, when I look at this, I see that there's two kinds of prospects out in the world, premium prospects and second grade prospects. A premium prospect, here's a couple of traits that we know that are true about them. Number one, 
their most valuable asset is time. Mm -hmm. Not money, time. In fact, they have more money than they do time. So think about if you put a funnel in front of them, automatically, what are we doing? We're discrediting their most valuable asset, time. They're saying, we're saying, give me your time. I want you to opt into my thing. I want you to watch a bunch of videos. I want you to go through this entire process. They're like, I don't have time for that. That's not, that's not me, right? Yeah. The second thing that's true about them is that they're marketing aware. And what I mean by that, it's like now there's, there's been so much marketing that's been done online in the internet space that when they see an opt-in or they see a, a VSL funnel or a webinar funnel, they automatically know that's just a sales pitch. I'm not going to learn anything. They're just going to try to sell me stuff. So they already know this. So why would they opt in for the whole thing, right? Funnel f- solution seekers, as I call them, like me, fast movers, they move quickly. They're like, I don't need all that. Eric, do you have a problem that, you, do you have a solution for my problem? Yes, let's talk and let's just get it going. I don't, I don't need all the rest of that stuff. Thirdly, information seekers versus solution seekers. Whenever we have a how-to kind of webinar or opt-in page or lead magnet or funnel, we are attracting what I call information seekers. People are always looking, or back to the question, they're looking to answer the question, how? And most people who are looking to answer the question, how, are not looking to solve the problem. They're looking to solve the problem themselves. They want to learn more information. If I can get more information, then great. I could figure out how to solve this myself. And then when we have a funnel and we convert 3% of them, we celebrate like, oh my God, 3%. And I'm thinking, well, maybe that's just a problem with the whole process. Mm. Solution seekers don't ask how, they ask who. And when we can present ourselves as that solution, going back to the whole category thing, if we can present ourselves as a new category, all of a sudden the conversations happen faster, the transactions happen faster, everything happens a lot better. So the whole point I'm trying to make is here, like even in my world, when we're talking about category kings, when my entire industry is basically talking about fancy funnels and Facebook ads, I'm here saying that's the worst thing you could ever do because it's not about a better mousetrap, AKA a funnel. It's about targeting a different prospect, AKA a mouse, a better mouse, that's yeah. a solution seeker that moves fast, who's asking who, not how, who has more, more, more money than time. And these are people who are going to engage with you and pay you top dollar for your solution. So I know that was a really long-winded way about going about all this. But the idea here is, again, if you're to start somewhere, A, you have to recognize how am I different than my competition? You have to create a category by identifying a problem in the marketplace that your ideal prospect may or may not even know that they have. Mm -hmm. See, because my whole marketplace says the only way to get new clients is through a funnel. And I'm saying, no, it's not. So it's shifting the mind to say, well, wait a second. Is that really true? I don't have to watch TV at seven o'clock PM on a Thursday night. No, you don't. And once they've bought into that realization, now all of a sudden, I'm the only person on the planet that could fulfill that problem because I created the category. If only so when you, you were can... passionate about what you're doing, that'd be great. I know, I know. It's just, I'm not interested in this stuff at all. <laughs> I People love tell it. me I got to get a little more excited about it. <laughs> I love it. Nick, um, on that note, creating a category or um, being different. Um, yes. I, I've heard more and more the last years that brands are now taking a stand on, on hmm. issues. Uh, and everybody's telling you, uh, yeah, you have to be authentic until being authentic is. Uh, frustrating people or offending people or creating issues. Uh, And and by the way, my good friend, Evan Neerman wrote a fantastic book called The Cancel Culture Curse Mm. uh, on that. So what is your advice when it comes to brand and personal brand for entrepreneur? uh, And when it comes to uh, advising them on being authentic or speaking their mind, or is there some uh, taboos uh, that they should not be uh, even considering? Well, I I think there's always going to be taboos and that's fine, right? But I think that is just defeating the whole idea of being authentic. Like if you, so there's two ways that I see it. If you are doing that just for the sake, like, you know, in our world, they call it clickbait. If you're just doing it for the sake of attention getting or, you know, demand generation or what, yeah. Like what's the point? Yeah. But if it truly aligns with who you are and you want to stand for something, then by golly, especially if it's a personal band, stand by it. Well, mm-hmm. what if I get canceled? So you get canceled. Like, and I don't even know what that even means. Like, 
they tried to cancel Joe Rogan and he's got a massive podcast and he's got more followers than every mass media publication out there on the planet. Who's going to cancel him? Because he's got his own platform and he gets to communicate through his own platform. Now, I get it. There's a ton of crazy people out there saying a lot of crazy things. And I'm not advocating that per se, but the idea of if you believe something and here's the thought behind it. I believe, especially in today, that if there's two people that have the exact same offer and the exact same business and the exact same model and the exact same pricing and the exact same promise, literally carbon copies of each other's business, the reason why a prospect would select A over B because they like him or her residents. Yeah, they resonate with them. Exactly. So it's that whole no like and trust. Well, why do I resonate with that person? I like how they talk. I like how they dress. I like what they say. I stand for what they stand for. And people say, well, then I, you know, that'll deter people away. I believe that repelling marketing is just as important as attraction marketing. Agree. Now, I'm not saying go ahead and be an enemy and try to be controversial for the sake of being controversial and polarizing for the sake of polarizing. But if you're doing your job well, like, you got to, I get some of my friends telling, showing me screenshots in forums and text groups and Slack channels and Facebook groups about people who take my posts and they're talking about how, like how much of a devil I am to say that funnels are a bad thing. Cause I'm rocking the boat. People who've built their entire businesses around funnels are now like, this guy's terrible. He's, he's don't, don't let him He's, he's lying. All of it's false. And like, great. There's going to be some people who hate me because of it. And I'm not trying to get them to hate me, but I'm just stating my facts. But there's other groups of people who are going to be like, I love this guy. This is exactly how I feel. Now, I know that funnels isn't a controversial topic. But again, at the end of the day, when you can be true to who you are and share who you are, that's going to allow people to say, well, I like Eric. I'm I'm connected with him. I, 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 I resonate with him. So if he has something to offer me that so does the other person, but but I have to choose between the two of them. I'm going to choose him as a result kind of thing. Awesome. Thank you. I I want to end this conversation today with a more personal question. You know, as an entrepreneur, the only thing that you know is going to happen is something that you don't expect. Uh, And uh, there's a say that my my grandfather always said is that uh, uh, the human beings make plans and God laugh. And Mike Tyson said it differently. He said, everybody's got a plan until they got punched in the <laughs> to face. To get punched so. in the face, yeah. <laughs> right? I like both of those. I like both so, of those quotes. So recently, uh, you live in beautiful Kelowna. Well, I've never yes. been there, but all the things that the, uh, you guys have been posting, I know it's beautiful. Uh, yeah. And then there was the uh, this natural disaster, the fire. Um, and tell us about how, how you went through that and the importance of, of community and the importance mm. of... Uh, focusing on, on what matters and, 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 and finding uh, how you went through it, uh, I think was absolutely uh, inspiring. Yeah, uh, thank you. So two years ago, we moved here, uh, almost two years ago to the day-ish from when we're recording this. And um, we lived in Toronto on the east coast of Canada, and we came out to visit Kelowna as, as a, just a trip because it was the middle of COVID and we wanted to travel. We found this beautiful place that existed in Canada that I didn't even know, I didn't even know was there. And all of a sudden, we're surrounded by mountains and lakes. And again, I'm, I'm born and raised in the suburbs of Toronto. So I'm a suburbanite to the core. Um, I don't go on hikes. I don't wake surf. I don't ski. That's not, that wasn't me. I don't mountain bike, like God forbid. I don't hike. And we moved out here and it completely changed our life. So we hike every day. Our kids are skiing in the winters, wake surfing and mountain biking in the summers. This is what we do. We're in nature all the time. We're surrounded by this beautiful energy that's really helped our family out. And I've really found a place that I can call home. And on top of that, you know, there's a beautiful community of people here that just make the experience that much better. You know, when you can live life, I'm not just saying do business, but when you can do life Mm -hmm. with people who are constantly challenging you and elevating you and people on the same path and people who are, who are just building people in our mutual community, right? Mm -hmm. That really elevates the game. And so we've been here for like two years. And it was, I guess, from the moment of recording, this is probably like three or four weeks ago now, three weeks ago, um, we were having dinner because one of our fellow people, one of our fellow mastermind members were here from out of town. We we're having dinner downtown Kelowna. And after dinner, we go outside and we look at the mountain and the mountain's basically this big like volcano poof of smoke. I'm like, huh, that, that, 
that doesn't look so good. And literally within minutes, you see the smoke. And then right over the ridge of the mountain, you start to see flames forming on the top of the mountain. And we're like, yeah, yeah well, that's, that's a little too close for comfort. Like it's right there on our mountain. So I rushed home. And by the time I got home, because we live on the top of the mountain, our streets were packed with like sightseers. And I was like, why is it so busy here? This is such a, it's a quiet, private neighborhood. No one, but everyone's trying to look at what's going on. So I go out to my backyard and I look out and, and I see now this fire has started on the ridge and has now come all the way down to the lake and is moving. And I saw, I saw this fire destroy entire neighborhoods in minutes, like consume the entire neighborhood in minutes. And I'm, I'm like, okay, this is a problem. To make a long story short, not long later, did the police knock on our door and said, the fire is 500 meters from your house. You, you have four minutes to pack your bags and get the hell out of here. And so we're like, oh, okay. We don't know what to do. This is our first time being in Kelowna. We don't have what's known as a go ready bag. Apparently, a lot of people who live out here have go ready bags in case. We didn't have this. So it's my wife and I and our two young kids. We have this one bag that's basically this big. And... I don't know how long are we going to be gone for 24 hours, 48 hours. I don't know. So I picked, I packed two t-shirts, a pair of shorts, a pair of underwear, forgot everything else. I did that for my kids, a couple of shirts, and we didn't even bring any shoes except the ones we were wearing. And we just started driving. Uh, fortunately that night we drove to one of our mutual friends' houses again in our mastermind, a beautiful man in our community. And we camped out there because he lives a little bit further out. Um, and then we just started watching the news and recognizing this is, this is bad. As we're driving away from that house, I remember like making eye contact with my wife and without even saying it, we just knew that there was a big possibility that every material possession that we owned could be gone tomorrow. And it was like one of those like strange come to Jesus moments where you're like, am I okay with that? Like mm. if I lose everything, all these things and even important things like wedding rings and photos and and even unimportant things like laptops and computers and like you just go through this mental assessment of like oh i could have brought that should i have brought this what about this what's important what's not am i attached to these things am i not but you didn't have a choice it's all mm. gone like mm. so we we're driving away looking at each other saying you know we we there's a high probability we're going to lose every material possession we own but our our interest was one thing primarily and that was to keep our kids safe and to not allow this to be a traumatic experience for our kids. And so they're watching this fire and we're trying to like, it's okay, we're just going to go. Don't worry, we're going to get in the car. We're going to go. And they're trying to navigate this thing. And again, to your point, the power of a good community. I got on the phone with a couple of our guys and I essentially asked, where are we going? It wasn't like, where are you going? And where am I going? And where like, it was, where are we going? And together in a minute, we just started driving towards the coast. So we live in the interior of British Columbia. We started driving towards Vancouver. Because ideally, the coast was the safest spot at this point. So we started driving to the coast. We got there. We recouped at a friend's house, another mutual friend of ours in our mastermind. Met him, spent the night there, had dinner there, and then just thought about, okay, what are we going to do? And long and short of it is, we ended up going to Whistler, British Columbia, um, which is one of the most beautiful spots in British Columbia. My family and I have never been there. And we had one of the most beautiful four family vacations that we've ever had for 10 days. And it was filled with hiking and the kids were in camps and we did mountain biking and we did the peak to peak gondola and the kids were rock climbing. And again, they had no idea what was going on at home because that was our job as parents to protect our children from both physical harm, but also mental harm. And so we had this beautiful experience with a bunch of families and we just, it, we lived it up and we made it a great vacation until we were called and said, 10 days later, um, you're allowed to go back home. Even to this day, at the moment of recording this, we're still on evacuation alert, which means at any given time, if they knock on our door again, you got to get out. But it's becoming controlled and settled. But that, that feeling of coming back into your home and like touching the things you own and being like, wow, okay, like this could all be gone was a very eye-opening experience. But it does, at the end of the day, really challenge you to ask yourself, what actually matters? Mm -hmm. Does the stuff matter? And I started to realize, and I, you always know this, but until you're challenged with it, like family matters, safety matters, community, our tribe, our people, they matter. Everything else can be replaced. 
And again, one of our mutual friends, Jason always says, um, you can take almost, any, I don't know if I get the quote right, but you can take almost anything from me or when I die, you can have it all away. But what I'll have, what you can't take from me is my relationships and the the relational equity that we've built with people around. And that just becomes far more like real when you're in a situation like this. And so to, to kind of go on the total other side of it, you know, they're, they're still doing some controlled burns and you can still see some flames every so often. And my mm-hmm. son looked outside and saw another plume of smoke, just like the one that started the fire's a a while ago and I thought oh man is he going to be scared like how's he going to react and he says daddy do you see the smoke and I said yeah and he goes does that mean we have to be evacuated again and I'm like son I don't know he goes ah I was looking forward to another vacation so like his association is positive like he doesn't recognize and so it means we did our job well as parents to not to not have to take away the fear out of the experience and recognize that you know life throws us various situations and yep. we've just got to do the best with what we can and make the most of it. So it's, you know, long and short of it is it turned into a great experience overall. We built deeper relationships with the people we love, with our families. We have a new perspective on life and material items. And, you know, you just come back being a better version of yourself and, and now wanting to bring that to the world. So so it's been it's been an interesting few weeks, but it's been great. Awesome. Nick, thank you so much for, for sharing that. And, and thank you for uh, sharing a little bit of all your knowledge. Uh, how do people get in touch with you? Well, there's there's a benefit to having a name like Nicholas Kuzmich. One, I'm the only Nicholas Kuzmich on the planet. So that's a good thing. You can find me on social or anywhere. The bad thing is it's not the easiest name to spell. So what I would say is if you want a free copy of my book and and, uh, join my newsletter, you can go to nicholaskuzmich.co.co, nicholaskuzmich.co. You can join the newsletter there. I put out weekly content. For those who are interested, of course, if you don't like it, you could leave. If you like it, you stay. I've got a ton of bonuses. We offer free coaching to people who are in there. You get a copy of my book and a bunch of other benefits. And so I think that's the best place to start a relationship with me. And then, of course, from there, we can see where where and how you need help, if anything. Wonderful. Thank you so much, my friend. And uh, I hope to visit you in Kelowna one day. I hope uh, so. And, and in the meantime, uh, thanks again for your time today. No, I appreciate you, Eric. Thanks for everything. Nick, thank you so much for your time and thank you for sharing those inspiring stories. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to connect with me, please do so on LinkedIn or join the Facebook group www.eventbusinessformula.com slash group. And if you enjoy this conversation, please share it with your network. Thank you. Bye-bye.